Test, test, test. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Marcus Sherman, or Better Idiot, and uh, starting up office hours today. And we will be covering uh, Markov chains and the the applicability of them in bioinformatics. Now, one of the core concepts of uh, Markov change chains are uh, being for more or less stateless, or I shouldn't say stateless, uh, memoryless, in that every moment that some that the next step being evaluated only considers the current step you're looking at. Um, that current step is uh, could be anything, and in the case of the example we'll be doing today, uh, we'll be highlighting what we did in uh, class yesterday. And that will be looking at Dr. Seuss material. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the complete text of One Fish, Two Fish, yada yada, whatever the name is. Uh, but this is this is just a toy example that we use, uh, mainly because it's easier for you to understand uh, as a user to understand text that is discrete. So. One fish is two different words, one and fish. But if you look at it in a in a bigger uh, scale, when we step back a little bit and look at it in with respect to genomics or proteomics or anything like that, when you're doing motif finding, is we can look at this entire sequence and uh, of whatever it is, amino acids, nucleotides, and start to discern where one thing may potentially change versus another. Uh, so there is an easy shift from Dr. Seuss to CPG islands to uh, whatever contact you're looking at. Uh, but we use these toy examples because it's a little easier to understand educationally. Another version of this is the uh, Durbinetti uh, implementation where they look at the uh, unfair casino or unfair dice. Uh, example where one dice is loaded and one dice isn't. You don't know which one you're throwing at that specific time. Lots of fun stuff there, especially when we get into uh, Markov, uh, hidden Markov models. But nonetheless, we de we're dealing with, uh, we're specifically dealing with Dr. Seuss today and Markov chain. We're not getting into hard, hidden Markov models. We're just dealing with Markov chain. So I'm going to paste a couple of things into chat. These will be some of the things we'll be using as far as text is concerned. So the this very first one that I'm going to be pasting, I found on GitHub, and it's particularly helpful. Um, chug it. Uh, it's particularly helpful because it gives us the complete text of the one fish, two fish text. And when we try to train the entire Markov chain, instead of just dealing with a select few lines of code, we can actually have the entirety of the text available. The second part is actually more of an announcement. The last office hours I covered was on Gibbs sampling, and I had promised to make that code that I'd created uh, available freely available to anybody that wants to look at it. So in the in the chat, I'm also going to paste, oops, sorry, I'm not also going to paste that uh that GitHub link to where I'm going to be posting my notebooks for this educational material. And that's going to be under my GitHub of Better Idiot. And uh, the specific repo is going to be under office hours. So uh this is going to change from week to week, uh, or office hours to office hours. Uh, I'm not going to be posting the code beforehand because it's going to be very interactive, or at least I intend it to be very interactive. And because it's live coding, we always have the danger of 
having bugs or magic computers occur. So, uh, for the sake of that, I'm going to give myself a chance to debug and then post the clean uh, code afterwards. So, today, let's just kind of get right into it and uh, talk about what we're doing. So, the very first thing I'm going to be dealing with is my virtual environment. And I'm just reiterating just to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Uh, I've done my Conda Activate uh, B529. B529 is the uh, Bioinformatics Algorithms and Concepts course at the University of Michigan. And this is a virtual environment built off of that. This includes uh, Python 3.7, specifically 3.7, uh, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Plotly, um, or not, sorry, not Plotly, uh, Seek Logo, uh, various sundry. If you're interested in figuring out what the incomplete environment is, feel free to DM me or whatever, and I will respond accordingly. So now that I'm in my environment, we need to move over to our testing area. Uh, I'm not going to do that directly. Uh, I've already launched some of the things uh, here, but this is just spawning up Jupyter Lab. Again, I always recommend spawning Jupyter Lab from uh, outside of the directory you're going to be dealing with, simply because I don't want to have to worry about how deep my my home directory my root directory within Jupyter Lab is. So I always spawn my Jupyter Lab from my root directory. So I have the ability to to or I should say home directory. I have the ability to move around as I see fit and look at some other folders instead of getting directly into the folder that I'm working. So I've already done that. That's just you activating and then let's bring up Jupyter Lab. Okay, so the big concept here in Markov changes, and we covered in class, is the idea of how one item can flow to the next and all the different possibilities of that item's transition, transition state. And with respect to uh, Dr. Seuss, we see that in this story, if, if I just pull up that text, And I'm going to read it. Uh, when we're looking at this in the Dr. Seuss story, we have one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. So that's just like the intro, one, one page per line, whatever. And if we look at this in example, it, if we see this all in conjunction with each other, it goes one to fish and two to fish, red to fish. So you see that transition state of some color to fish. But when you look at it in the full scope of everything, if fish were like the center spoke of this wheel, it could go to any of these uh, numbers or colors. So fish can go to one, fish can go to red, and so on and so forth, and all those different combinations. And once you build this chain up, once you build all these tran potential transitions, we can actually go through and look at how many times those transitions occur within the text. and that is that allows us to start developing uh, a frequency of how many times this transition is likely to happen. Here I say that likely, that means that this can directly be related to the probability. So when we use this, once we've defined a Markov chain or a Markov model, we can use this to create new lines of text. And ideally, at the end of this, we can create a sentence that is very Seussian like uh, because it was built off of Seussian language. So, uh, using this, I'm going to jump off in, right into the code. And the idea here in the very beginning is I want to start my imports. Imports are obviously where we're always going to carry off from. And I, I'm going to go a different direction than what we saw in class, if you were in the class. And that's instead of using NumPy, I want to use the random or the random uh, package within the standard library. And this is only because it's a little bit more performant. And my idea is less is more when it comes to Python. NumPy is 
terrifically performant. It is great. And uh, I won't argue with anybody about that. But when we're talking about the scale in which we're looking at right now, the idea here is this is the difference of building a bus versus just walking to the walking 10 steps. What's quicker? You're going to walk 10 steps. It, or I should say, re rephrase that. If I walk 10 steps, I'm actually getting that 10 steps faster than if I were to get into the bus, turn on the bus, and then drive the bus and then stop 10, 10 steps away. It takes a whole lot more to spin up NumPy than it does to just, if we're working on the small scale we're working at, than it does to just use the standard library. So that's why I'm sticking with it. I'm also going to be bringing in the string library um, because we're going to be removing some punctuation because we're using the complete Susian text of one fish, two fish. It has punctuation marks in there, like exclamation marks, hyphens, periods, commas. We don't want those to influence our Markov model. So uh, within the string library, we have access to this idea called the uh, string dot punctuation. That includes all the ASCII punctuation. Uh, and additionally, I'm implementing mine a little differently simply because, or I'm in implementing my Markov model a little differently because it allows using a, a different type of dictionary. And if you were here for office hours last time, the idea or the dictionary I like to use for these kind of things, especially when I'm doing frequency counts, is the counter dictionary. It's an extremely performant dictionary that's part of the standard library that is built expressly for the purposes of counting. So with those imports out of the way, whoop, collections, I've coded for you. Um, with those out of the way, uh, the very first aspect that we're going to have to cover is how are we actually going to uh, ingest the data, ingest the text, because we need to have our information available. So because I'm using a text file, and again, if you look at the link, uh, I'll post that again here. If you look at the link in at this GitHub, it's the raw text. I've just saved this locally to my own computer as one fish, two fish dot text. And I'm just going to create a function just for handling this text. So um, ingest text, and all I'm going to give it is a, a text file. Uh, and a Markov model. And the only reason I'm doing this Markov model is if the user decides to build uh, a Markov model based off multiple type of text. So instead of just saying, oh, this is one fish, two fish, and we want to create a sentence that is like one fish, two fish, uh, we could say, let's look at the complete works of Dr. Seuss and create a Seussian like sentence at the end. So here you can build your Markov model based off of all of the Seussian text, and it's going to come out looking like garbage, but that's the point of this. Is we can extend this to anything. So here we're going to say, oops, here I'm going to uh, say with open, and I'm just going to open up that text file as text. And here I'm going to initialize that Markov model. Since I've created my Markov model, to be Markov model equals none, this allows us to, if the user doesn't supply a Markov model, it'll uh, create one for us. So here I'm just going to say Markov model equals Markov model. So this, this allows the user to overwrite a, uh, an init initiated or instantiated, initialized Markov model where it's just a dictionary. And now I'm going to say for line in text. So now I'm going to iterate through that text one line at a time, and that's just looking for the end of line characters, the backslash n, or yeah, back, backslash n, or uh, backslash rn, or whatever uh, operating system you're on. But I'm going to format these lines because there's a lot of weirdness that I have to deal with. So I'm going to say line equals format line, and then I'm going to give that now. This is a function. It doesn't exist yet. I'm about to create it. And the whole idea here is I don't want to put a ton of that crap inside my ingest text format or my index test function. I want to do that outside of it because that's ideally that's something that is easily repeatable over and over again. And I don't need those all inside the same function. So I'm going to write up this 
uh, format text. And the and with this, I'm going to say def format line, and all I'm going to give it is line. Now, the very first thing we need to do with this is uh, remove the. Uh, we need to control for the case, the letter case, and we need to control and clear out the end of line characters like the backslash n, backslash rn, or whatever is there. So the first thing is I'm going to say line equals line dot uh, strip. Line dot strip gets rid of those end of line characters. And now I can say line dot case fold. And what's special about case fold is that uh, all it does is make the entire sentence or the entire line lowercase. So why wouldn't I use dot lower? Well, if we expand this, if we look at this as a scale much larger than this, if we're dealing with text that has potentially weird characters or, or different languages like uh, uh, Cyrillic languages, you can't always lowercase them because they're not, because they're ASCII. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. It's, it's difficult to lowercase them. So casefold is actually more aggressive across all those different ASCII characters. So I just use casefold, lowercase everything. Uh, that's just me being me. Now we need to go through and remove punctuation. So remove punctuation. Now with the remove punctuation, I need to just iterate through the care or iterate through the line. So for car and line. And now I'm going to say if a car in string dot punctuation. Now this is that special uh, library that we imported here at the very top, string.punctuation. If we just wanted to look at it real quick, it's just a, a, a helpful list of all the punctuation marks in that is carried over by the string library. Um, so here we have everything from hyphen, period, colon, whatever we're going to have to deal with as far as normal punctuation is concerned. So in doing this, I can say, if this character is in this string of punctuation, I'm just going to replace it. I'm going to say line, or sorry, uh, line dot replace, and I'm going to replace that character with a blank. So this allows me to remove any instances of commas or periods and just uh, put everything together. This is a very a uh, simplistic and naive way of looking at the problem. There are more elegant solutions, specifically when we're dealing with regex, or what happens when we have a word that is hyphenated, like half-hearted or something like that. Uh, we're making a lot of assumptions in this case. This isn't always the best way to handle this. We can get more robust if we wanted to, but for the case, for the purposes of today, we're just doing this. So now that I've removed all the punctuation. The last thing I need to do is to split that line up into the subsequent words. And we just do that by saying return line dot split. And we're assuming that the this line is split on white space or spaces. If it were split on tabs, we would change it up as we see fit. But right now we're just saying return this list as a or return this line as a, as a list. So here, when we've gone through this text, we get that line, and then I, I pass that line to format line, and what that gives me out is a list. So now I'm dealing with a, a list of words. So from this, I can start building my Markov models. When we get into it, uh, we'll see this in a second, but I'm going to say Markov model equals build Markov model. And I'm just going to give it that line and then potentially this pre-existing Markov model. Now, the fun part about this is, is because we've defined the Markov model up here on line three, um, if the user gives us a pre-existing Markov model, we'll just continue to update that Markov. Uh, but if it is none, what's going to happen is if this, if this function build Markov model was written correctly, 
it'll initialize the Markov model as an empty dictionary in that case. But every time we add new material from a given text, it'll constantly update it. So you see how it recycles. It goes from Markov model up here. We pass that into here. It gives us out a Markov model, and then it starts the next line, which just continues to, this goes into here, and then that goes out, so on and so forth. So we just keep on recycling and updating the same. Now, at the very end of this, uh, after I've built up my Markov model and everything, I'm going to return that Markov. This is just so if the user wants to save it or they want to play around with it or whatever, this just allows us to generalize this on a specific set of text. Okay, so if I press Shift Enter and I try to run this cell right now, it's going to yell at me because build Markov function doesn't exist. So I'm just going to put this here. Uh, just to play around. So I'm going to say def build Markov model. And there's going to be a couple of things in here that I can do with this, uh, like giving it a seed, giving it a text file. But as we see here, all I need is a line of text, a Markov model, but I'm going to give it a uh, a default value of none in the case that a user uh, doesn't go through ingest text and they want to build Markov model directly from their own specific line of text. And then the last part, I'm just going to say seed equals none. And this is for demonstration's sake in that we're going to control the random seed in here so that everybody watching this and following along can get the same results more or less, so long as you're using the same link that I've done before. So uh, I'm going to try to, I'm going to paste that link again to text in case you're late coming into this. And in this function, I'm just going to say pass right now, simply because I just want to define ingest text. I don't want to deal with ingest text anymore. Done with it. Um, so let's move on and get into uh, the build Markov model. Now, uh, build Markov model. The idea is to go through the text one line at a time and create a dictionary of dictionaries of counts for specific words. So if we're at one fish, if we're at fish, what are all the different ways that fish can transition to another word? So uh, one or red or blue or anything that a fish, that the word fish can transition to. What is, what is that? And this is actually, it sounds like a complicated concept in that you're keeping track of all this stuff. And while I agree that uh, doing dictionary of dictionaries isn't the most elegant, it is potentially the most efficient because dictionary lookups are super fast. So um, there's a lot to be said here. I'm going to copy and paste uh, the doc string for this function. And that's just me just being explicit about this, but I'll explain each of the steps. So the first part I'm going to do is I'm going to check for an existing Markov model. So I'm going to say if Markov model equals is none, sorry, is none, this means the user hasn't supplied a Markov model. So there is, they haven't provided us with anything, so we have to create a base state. So now I'm just going to say Markov model equals, and since it's a dictionary of dictionaries, I can use these two curly braces to say uh, I want to create an empty dictionary. Okay, so now we've initialized our Markov model. Now we have to start playing around with the, the states. So uh, here, I'm just going to do some bookending. And bookending just means I'm going to take what I already have and I'm going to Put something on the tail end of it. So Markov models, they're besides just saying one fish, two fish, like where does fish go to? We have to think of what about the very first instance? What about the very first part of the sentence? Uh, and that is the start state. Like before we've actually gotten into any data, we have to be in a start state. Uh, furthermore, when we get to the end of uh, a sentence or whatever like that, we have to have an end state, the, this we are exiting the Markov, so to speak, or we're exiting our data set. So 
I'm going to say words equals, and we're just going to define our start state by some simple string. Like X. But this allows it, because of this star S star, this allows us to look for a very uh, special instance of the start state. Because if we just use the word start, we would actually come into a problem because what if the text has the word start in it? And uh, we might have a problem with that. So we use this unique start character or string uh, to identify this. And I wrapped it in brackets because what that does is it takes that and puts it inside, it takes that string and puts it inside of a list. And now I can just take the that line. Now, if you remember that line, what's being given to this line, uh, what's being given to this line from ingest text is the already split line. So it's already giving us a list. So I just need to take that list that's already been stripped, it's already been case folded, and it's already been split, and I just need to give it to this, uh, this new variable. And now I'm gonna bookend at the very end with end. So same context as the start. Uh, starry star. So now I have the bookend, this gives me my start and end. Uh, and now we get into the meat of it, the, the hardest part of this function. And let's do this. So for current future, so then this tells me that I'm going to be unpacking two values from uh, whatever text I'm dealing with. So just keep that in mind. I'll talk about this in a second. For current future in word editor, and I'm going to give the words. Okay, so those of you that are astute, you'll see that this is a specific, this is a new function that I haven't written yet. And that's because I want to expand on some stuff in a second to better elucidate some of the different approaches people can use for iteration purpose. So uh, I'm just going to say pass for now, just because I want it to still be a valid, it's kind of like I'm putting a thumbtack in it. I just want to come back to this in a second. So let's look at this word iter. And this word iter is actually nothing special. I'm just doing it for the purposes of uh, presenting alternatives to users on different ways you can iterate through this concept. So uh, let's say def, def word iter. And I'm just going to give these words, that list of words that we've just created to include the S. The way to think about this is, is there's different ways of doing it. If, we, if you look back at the examples we had in 529, we have 4i in range, and then you say 0 to len uh, words uh, minus 1. Now, the concept that was used when it was written here is, I want to start at the position 0, or, position, or I want to start at index 0. I want to start on index 0. And from index zero, I want to slide along all the, the uh, items within this word list and pull them out. And the reason it's truncated here at the end by minus one is because ideal, what the idea here is we want to look ahead. We want to look to the future, so I plus one, to look at the next word. And if you didn't do this minus one, what happens is you would actually get to the tail, you get to the end of the list, and you would get an index error. So that minus one offsets us offsets it and lets us use this. Now, a little bit of code review uh, allows me to just say I can delete this because range always starts at zero unless it's told otherwise. I'm lazy. I want to save keystrokes, and this is one of the ways that you do it. So uh, from here, I'm going to say current equals words, and then I'm going to look at that position, and then future equals words I plus one. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. It's not the preferred way as long, like this is very language agnostic. There's a lot of languages that this has a very much a, a regular pattern that you see. Uh, and if you're in R, if you're in C, C++, if you were to read this, it would make sense to most programmers what's going on here. However, this isn't the most Pythonic way. So I'm going to just comment this out and we're going to look at a different way. Uh, this is the way that I would naturally uh, 
uh, navigate to or naturally uh, orbit around because I really like this function. So I'm going to say for I and word in enumerate words. And uh, because I'm going to be going up to, but not all the way to the end, I can do a special little fancy colon minus one. And what this says in list words, because remember, words is just a list. In this, in what this means in lists, is saying I want to take everything up to, but not including the last item. And since I'm still basing this on an index position, because this is how enumerate works, it gives you, it always gives you two items. The first item will always be the index position of the item it's looking at. And then the second item will be the item that it's looking at. So uh, here, if I'm going along with index positions, if I want to get the future, I can still do I plus one it below. But the difference here is I can say uh, current equals word and future equals words I plus one. So we still get the same exact thing. Now, this is the way that I, again, I navigate to this method. Uh, mainly because in Python 2.7, previous versions of Python, the next function that I'm going to show you was actually not as performant as uh, this enumerate or indexing because it would essentially double the amount of memory required. And, you'll, and I'll explain in a second. So for now, I'm just going to, again, comment this and introduce another method that is actually a little bit more readable and in python 3.7 is slightly very minutely more performant than the enumerate method and the idea here is i'm going to say for current future so this should automatically give you the hint that i'm going to be skipping the indexing issue and i'm just going to be giving back the words directly and the special function we're going to be doing is called zip and what zip does is if I give it two iteratables, if I give it the, the list of A, B, C, D, and then I give it one, two, three, four, it would put A with one, B with two, C with three, and D with four. So I can take two iteratables and put them together. Well, I can just look at the list and uh, pull out offsets to it. And on, again, on a small scale, this isn't a huge deal. So if I say words and I just want to go to minus one. I don't want to go up to and to the very end. So that's my first iteratable is the list minus the last one. And my second, oops, sorry, my second is going to be words. And I'm going to start at one and I'm going to go to the very end. So here I'm offsetting the list. So if you think of it in like hanging, hanging uh, tag, hanging uh, lists, hanging alignment, one list starts here, one list starts here. And then it goes off until uh, one ends here and one ends here. If you look at it linear, in a linear mindset. Um, now, this can be dangerous. And in a small scale like this, this is actually okay. And in Python 3.7, this is particularly special because zip, uh, or not 3.7, in Python 3, zip became lazy uh, by nature. Instead of because in previous iterations of it, it would create the entire list all at once, the entire zip list. And if you're working with a sufficiently large data set, this could be very dangerous. Uh, but in Python 3, zip became an iterator. So it'll only do what it's expected when you ask for it. Uh, the issue, the part, the the part that can be kind of dangerous is that we say this words colon minus one, what we're essentially doing is we're copying an existing list and we're truncating it. So it's a minutely smaller than the previous list, but it's a new list altogether. Anytime you take a slice of a list, you're actually, uh, you're not looking at a reference to that list. You're actually copying the list. So the same idea here is now I've essentially doubled the length of my list because I have two different iterations of the same exact list. So again, this is a scale problem, but for readability's sake, this is very helpful. Uh, I can't particularly talk to the kernels here that are going on with Python, but nonetheless, for the sake of this, it's very straightforward. So no matter which way you choose, if you choose the range length way, and if you choose the enumerate way, or if you choose the zip way, Either case, depending on whichever one you uncomment, we just yield 
current, future. So that's all my word iter is. That's all it is is just giving my current word and the future. Um, you could easily put this uh, word iter. You could take whatever line you want and put it into the build Markov model. But I just set this aside uh, so that users or ed uh, learners can look at it and uh, pick and choose which one they're more comfortable with, one, the one that makes more sense to them, and then completely drop it in place with whatever's here. So with that being said, all you have to do is just uncomment these lines of whichever method you choose and comment the ones out that you don't. Whatever. That's up to you. So now that we're with... Uh, Sorry, if you can hear that in the background, my dogs have seen the mailman and are very angry at me. Uh, hopefully it's not too loud on you. Okay, so going back to our build Markov model, uh, we're, now that we have isolated the current word and the future word, the only two aspects of the line that we care about in context of the Markov model, uh, we just need to add them to the model. Now, we can do a lot of fun stuff where it's like checking to see if it's in the dictionary or try accept key errors. Um, and for that, I can explain in greater detail if you have any questions offline, but I'll show you just my implementation of it. Uh, it may not, it may look a little clunky, but when you look at how the operators uh, work in conjunction with each other, it actually makes very easy sense. And you can boil this entire building the Markov model down to one. So here we're saying Markov model, again, just put it in your mind that Markov model is just an empty dictionary. Okay? So in the first case, there's nothing in, that, in the model. There's nothing. Okay? So we're going to say Markov model. And instead of looking for is word in dictionary or any of those other steps, I can actually use a method of dictionaries that is already built into them that does something specific to this case, and that's called set default. And what set default says is, I want to look for this item. And if this item doesn't exist, I want to put something in its place. This way, we kind of skip the whole try accept key error thing, uh, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, here, we're going to say, I want to look at my current word and see if my current word is in the dictionary. And if it's not in the dictionary, what I want to put in its place is that counter. Now, if you remember from all the way up to the imports, this counter is a special dictionary that it kind of feels like a set, meaning it's just a list of keys. However, what's special about it is when you put a new item, you update this dictionary with a new item, it actually keeps track of how many times that item's been seen. The specific purpose of it is counting the number of, of, of occurrences. So here when I'm saying I want to uh, add this word to the dictionary, if that word doesn't exist, I'm going to add that word to the dictionary and then its value, because remember dictionaries are key values, the value for that word is going to be a, an empty counter. Now what's special about this is if the word exists, it just already pulls out what's already there. So this kind of lets us uh, step past the try accept here paradigm. So now that, I'm, now that we think about this this way, we've said, I want to look for this item. And then if this item doesn't exist, I want to counter. But either way, no matter what, because this is a set default, what you're always going to have is some key, which is the, the word, and the value, which is going to be a counter. So what this function does is it returns to me whatever is associated with that key, which is always going to be a counter, which is just technically a dictionary. So with that a dictionary, I can update that dictionary. So I'm going to add something to that dictionary. And when you update a counter, all you update it with is the future. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. So what this line does is it looks in a current in the at the current if the current word doesn't exist it's a, no matter what that current word will always be associated with 
count as a value. And then when that re set default returns to us that count, no matter what it is, if it already exists or if it doesn't. So we take that counter and now we've done a method on that counter. Since it's a dictionary, dictionaries have the update. And all I'm saying in that counter is I want to add this future word to the dictionary. So what counter does is it sees this future word and it counts how many times this future word has been associated. So in the case of Dr. Seuss, if you're thinking one fish, two fish, three fish, red fish, blue fish, blah, 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 whatever it is, it would see fish is the word and its counter would have red, blue, one, three, and it'd be have the number of times those words are have been seen associated with the word fish. Okay. Now, once I have that, I've essentially built the Markov model. So I'm just going to say return Markov model. That function's done. That's honestly the hardest part of this whole thing was doing this function. So let's look at this in context. Uh, when we look at this ingest, ingest text, I'm going to use this ingest text. I'm going to say ingest, I'm going to say mm equals ingest text. And I'm going to give it something. And uh, I'm just going to give it the text file I have. So I saved it locally. And it's as Yeah, let me do some file key quick. Should have. Okay, so now I have this ingest test, ingest text, and it'll read this file and create a Markov model from it, ideally speaking. Okay, what I do? Format line is. There we go. Okay, so if we look at this Markov model, remember it's a dictionary of dictionaries, it looks Kind of ugly because dictionaries don't always look great. Uh, yeah, to fix that error, Emily, it's just I didn't actually shift enter on format line or that I uh, I actually ran ingest text before format line was defined. So if you just redefine format line and then redefine, like rerun the ingest text, it should work. It's just because I did things. Um, when we look at this dictionary, dictionaries are kind of ugly by nature, but there's a cool little trick we can do to try to make them look a little different, make them look a little better. If anybody's played around with any internet stuff, they know, they've probably heard of the word JSON. And JSON means JavaScript object notation, and essentially JavaScript object notation, JSON, just dictionaries are dictionaries. So it makes sense that we might be able to leverage the JSON module to make our dictionaries look a little prettier. So we can do this by saying import JSON. And then from JSON, I'm going to say print JSON.dumps. Has to be dumps with an S, not dump, because dump tries to dump to a specific file. Dumps allows us to dump to the standard out. So I'm going to say dumps, and uh, I'm going to take that Markov model that we just created. I'm going to sort keys through ter. And then the last part is I'm just going to say indent equals four. Now, this is just a version of pretty print. I'm pretty printing this dictionary. And now you can see that it indents it a little different. So you can actually discern exact elements. So we see that the start position of this text. And if you guys haven't seen this, let's just look at this real quick. This is all that text file is, that one fish, two fish. So this is all one line. Because obviously, here's the beginning, and then here's the end. That's that period at the punctuation. However, in Seussian-like language, 
it's usually, if you think about it in one page, one page has one fish, the next page, two fish, the next page, red fish, and the next page, blue fish. That's all one sentence, Seuss world, but when you look at it with respect to line endings, those are all separate pages. So going back, we see that start, there's a lot of words that start is associated with, and that's because of the very short sentences that Dr. Seuss uses. It's fine. It doesn't matter. At least for the purposes of what we're dealing with today. If you do go back and you look at the 529 note or the 529 repo uh, and look at this class, Alan already uh, curated some of these uh, some of these sentences for you and removing some of this stuff. No big deal. Um, and I'm looking at some of the punctuation. Okay. Doesn't matter. Again, just keeping in mind what we're doing. Very simple. But now we can look at this. We see that S starts at a certain spot. A lead goes to these other words. And so on and so forth. Fun, right? Gonna minimize. Yeah. I'm gonna go. There it is. So, if we were to use exactly what Alan had give, given us, the sentences would have already been formatted and we'd be controlling for very specific language or very specific grammar that Seuss uses and thoughts instead of uh, page thoughts. Um, give Emily a second to look over the form of line. Nonetheless, you can see that building this Markov model actually goes very smooth when you use this, this uh, set default dot up and quickly ingest a lot of text very, very easily using this method. Hoping that you are good. If you need to go back, you can just rewind, Emily, pause. No big deal. Uh, furthermore, after I'm done with this, I should uh, be posting this class or my office hours repo. Um, but I'll do that afterwards. Anyways, let's move on. I just want to show you this cool that cool trick for visualizing dictionaries. It's a different. So now we've built our Markov model. We've built our Markov Markov model. Now the fun part about using a Markov model is now we can look at it and go, okay, we have the frequencies of words being used in conjunction with another word. Well, we can use that probabilistically and say, oh, I want to look ahead. Given this specific word, I want to guess what the next word's going to be. So essentially, if you built this off of all of uh, Tolkien's works, you could come up with a very, very, very naive way of creating another Tolkien-like sentence or Tolkien book, whatever. The same thing with the whole Harry Potter series feed into this and essentially should kind of sound like Harry Potter. It's not going to be like those fancy ones you hear online where people develop, wrote a bunch of stuff uh, for like neural networks and artificial intelligence and machine learning and stuff. Uh, but this is one of the strengths of dynamic programming. You can look at the past, the future. So the next stage of this is we have to look at uh, Create like get how do we get that next word? Next. And here we're gonna actually finally use uh I'm gonna add actually I'm gonna add something to my ingest text. Uh and it's just an argument that I'm gonna say seed equals none. And then I'm gonna pass that seed to the build Markov model. Because if you look here, I had my first argument was line. My second argument was the Markov model. My third argument was seed. Now this allows us to 
uh, control for the randomness that we're using in our selection. And since this is the ingest text is intended to be the entry point into this, actually, you know what? We don't even need seed. All right. We don't need seed on this. I'm going to just delete. I don't need seed because building the Markov model doesn't matter about seed. Okay. Um, but when you're getting the next word, seed does matter. And I'll talk about this in a second. So uh, the arguments here, our current word, what are we looking at? What is our Markov model? And here I'm just going to say equals none, just because I like, like to control for what happens when nothing's there. Uh, the next part is seed equals none. Because now we're looking at it and we're saying, based off where we are, we want to look at the probabilities. And when we start dealing with probabilities and sampling, you start dealing with randomness. So because of that, if we set the seed for demonstration sakes, uh, demonstration sake, we can actually reproduce the results based off of if you're using the same file, done the same I've done, you should get the same results. But setting it to none allows us to say if we don't set seed, it'll just do pseudo random anyways. But if we do set seed, uh, we can overwrite to some extent. So here, uh, again, I'm just going to copy and paste the doc string for this function. It may look a little different than what you guys have, but doesn't matter. Now, here we need to do, we need to actually use that seed. We've told it what the seed is. Let's actually use it. I'm going to say random.seed equals seed. Now remember, if seed is none, it's just going to, it's not going to set a seed. But if uh, seed isn't none, it'll set it to that and we're guaranteed to get the same random result every time. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of aliasing. Uh, aliasing is just me giving a name to something uh, to make it a little bit more concise or to reduce the amount of text that's actually written on a single line. Prevent multiple dictionary loops. Um, every time, okay, so before I get into this, every time you do a dictionary lookup, that's a function. It's, something is happening. Now, it's really quick. Dictionary lookups are very quick because everything's hashed. Uh, however, if you do that multiple times, it actually gets, you're dragging on. And one of the slowest things in Python are functions. So we can alias this in a way uh, to reduce some of that. And all we're going to say is, I want to look at my current word, our Markov model, and I want to look at the current word that we're interested in. This will give me all of the words that that word can transition to. It'll give us a dictionary. And remember, this is a counter dictionary. So it's going to say, Every key is going to be the word, and every count is the number of times that word has been associated with this current word. So now I'm just going to call this current. Now I'm doing this so that I don't have to type Markov model brackets current word every single time. I could just keep using cur from here on out. Because there's two aspects that I care about when it comes to this cur. I care about the keys, because I need to select which word it's going to be. And I care about the values because those values are just frequencies, so they allow us to uh, determine probabilities, so to speak. So first we need to get the weights, because if we're going to randomly sample, we need to get uh, weights to base it off of, probabilistic sample. So to get those weights, a lot of people would want to go straight to NumPy. So I want to take those counts, Put them into an array and then just sum and blah 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 and all that other stuff. Again, that that's that's you have one tool and you're trying to everything. It, oh, sorry. If you all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Concept. Um, but plain Python, and I've done a little bit of testing with this prior to the office hours. Plain Python at this scale is actually super fast and faster than uh, NumPy. Because we don't have to spin up a whole NumPy array and like 
memory and all that other stuff. So we can actually do this pretty simple, simply by saying val, whoops. Okay, so I'm going to say val sum, and I'm going to say cur.values. Because remember, a dictionary has keys, values, items. Essentially how you iterate through a dictionary. Keys are the keys, values, values, items, couples, tuples of uh, the key and value. So here I'm saying I want to look through all the values. Well, Python sees this as a list of integers, so it just sum them up, right? And then I'm just taking, and I'm doing this all within a list comprehension. So I can say for val in per dot values. So here, every step along the way, I'm saying for every value, I'm finding out the probability of that value being seen for this specific word. Real quick and dirty way to get the weights. The next step is, uh, now that we have the weights, we need to do our, next, our random sample. So I'm going to say next state, and this is very similar to some of the stuff you've seen in class, uh, but the only difference here is instead of using numpy.choice, I'm going to be using the random library. So this is just random.choices with an S, not this. And that's with this, it allows us to use uh, weights. So uh, I'm going to say weights equals weights. We've already done it. OK, so the only other aspect here is we need to figure out what we're going to be sampling from. Now, the issue with this is if you take a uh, numpy, if you take, sorry, numpy, if you take a dictionary and you say dot values or dot keys, it gives you a list like item, but it's not a list. It's called a dict values object that operates a lot like a list. You can index it and everything like that. But because of that special case of it being called a, uh, a dict values, dict keys, uh, you can't just plug that in here doesn't always work correctly. But we can get around this by using uh, the idea of uh, unpacking. So we can say uh, cur.values, or sorry, cur.keys, because we want which word. cur.keys. And the special aspect that we're going to be doing for this unpacking is I'm saying, I want all these keys inside of a list, a plain regular list. Well, if you try to do this, what it's going to say is dict keys can't run, like can't be unpacked into a list or can't, isn't indexable, some silly error. Um, the way to do this is we say, okay, all of the things that are in this dict keys, I want to unpack. And the way to do that is putting this star in front of it. So, so long as you have these brackets, indicating that you're creating a list, and you put this star in here, it'll unpack, it'll look at each of the items within that list and unpack it into this plain list. So here we're saying, using this, random choices, we're going to select from these keys, all the keys of this counter uh, dictionary, based off of the uh, weights that we've already calculated, select the probabilis probabilistically most likely uh, or probabilistically selected next word. And then once we're done with this, return state or next whatever call it. So that finishes up get next word. Get done. It's actually very straight. So. The last part of this was actually generating your random data. And this is actually where you get to play around and have fun with your Markov. So let's start with that function, def generate and uh, text. And uh, I'm going to give it a uh, the Markov model that I've already built. I'm going to give it some start state because uh, I don't. I always want to assume. I, I don't ever want to assume that that person is always going to, or whatever you're using, your start state's always going to be star s star. So I want to give the ability, uh, the generalizability uh, to the user to define whatever they want. So I'm going to say start 
state equals, and here I'm going to do that star s star, end state equals star e star. So again, this is the same concept. I'm just giving a default value because for our purposes, it doesn't really matter, but I'm just being as thorough as possible. And then the last part here is seed equals none. Because this is, besides random choice, this, this generate next word is the entry point for us to actually use get next word. So since generate random text is the entry point, we, that's where the user defines the seed. Because then that seed gets passed on to get next word, and then it's actually pulled. So since this is the that position, now I'm just going to copy and paste some doc strings over and over again. We're going to take this current word equals start state. So now you see that right off the bat, I've set the very beginning of my Markov model is based off of whatever the start state is. Now here the user can define it, but we can also just say star star. We don't even have to define it because it's already predefined as a default value. Um, the next part is uh, we need to keep track of what words we've seen up to this point. So I'm going to say sentence equals just an empty string because I'm just going to be appending a bunch of stuff to this string over and over. Now, the idea is we're saying we're starting at this start state, star s star. What are all the possibilities of star s star? Or what are all the word possibilities of star s star, however you see fit? What is the next possible word? It's going to take that next word, add it to the sentence. And then from that point, it's going to look for the next word for that current word, so on and so forth. And sooner or later, you get to the very end of this, and that's when it says, okay, based off of probability, we can actually get to the point where we see the star E star or the end state. And when that end state's finished, when we actually receive that end state, we're going to finish this off with like a period or something like that, and then we're just going to send off that generated text. So we're essentially going through a sentence and we're creating it, and we're finding those uh, everything that goes in between that star, uh, star s star and star e. So now I have my sentence that I'll be pending to this, and now I'm going to say uh, our while statements while because we want to keep getting new words until we see that that end state. So uh, while current word is not equal to our end state. While our current word is not equal to our end state, so until we see that starry star, I'm going to say um, current word equals get get next word Markov current. And the mark and C. Okay, so all we're saying is where we're at, where we were previously, which is the start state. What is the next word given that start state? That becomes our new current word. Uh, once we take that current weird word, we need to check to make sure that we haven't gotten or we're not at the end of the sentence. So we check this by saying uh, if current word is not equal to end state, it seems like we've already done this before, but this is saying the first one was saying was the last one we looked at in end state, and now is the new one we're looking at in end state. But ideally, this doesn't really matter because if we've tracked this end state in this condition, uh, we should just be able to exit gracefully. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm adding this here because I'm saying if this is the end state, I want to make sure that uh, I finish out the sentence. Good English teacher will tell me. Finish it with some. So here I'm going to say if it's not the final end, if, if it's not the uh, 
the end state, I'm going to use this F string. Now, this is special to Python 3.6 and greater. And if you're in Bio 5.29, Bioinformatics 5.29, you should be using Python 3.7. So you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, an F string is called a format string. And it allows us to add variables within something all within this text. So I'm going to add a space, and then within curly braces, I'm going to add current word. So what this will do is it'll take sentence, and it'll append to the end of the sentence this new string that is space delimited from the current word. It'll add the next current or the current word with the space in between it. Um, and it's these. The F strings are actually faster than doing joins uh, or just doing plus, equals, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to deal with it. If you feel like looking it up or feel like talking to me, you can uh, DM me or email me. So now we look at the case of when it is equal to the end state. So now I don't want to actually add or append that end state to it. But what I do want to append to it is a punctuation. Here, I'm just going to say period. It could be whatever you want. And now, after I'm done with everything, because now, ideally, here it's like saying, I have gotten to the, uh, I'm all the way up to the end state. So then this while loop actually breaks. Done. Met its exit condition. So now that we're done with this exit condition, I can say, return uh, sentence. And that should generate our random text. Okay, so let's play with this and see what happens. The first part I'm going to do is ingest my information, my one fish, two fish. And the next part I'm going to do is just I'm going to generate some random text. I get Oh, I forgot to do this. I forgot that what choice does. So if we look back at get next word, get next word choices or numpy.choice, it always returns to you a list because it's assuming that the user is going to want more than one uh, item. But if the user gives you, if the user defines one, it still gives you a list. It'll always give you a list. So if we go to this get next word and uh, put this bracket zero, what it does is send, says the return value of this is a list. I just want that first item. That first item, I only have one. So I'm just going to return that one. It's the only change here. And now I'm going to read. We look at that, and that's all it took for us to get to a sent, uh, one single sentence, 11, 2. And some are fat, and some are little, has a little star. Whatever, we can keep playing with this as we see fit. And I'm just going to put this through an iterator. So, for i in 5, range 5, print 5 random sentences. So, uh, with here, I'm just going to give this a minute or two before I move on. Are there any questions about any of these implementations up till now? All right. Thanks, Emily. Hopefully you found that as helpful. Did, did, did you guys feel like this was uh, clarify some of the logic, at least some of the logic I use in tackling this problem, these kind of problems? I'm always I'm always worried that I think a little too abstractly or, or too Python. I, I, uh, I think a little differently because I know all the different aspects of Python or all the different approaches that sometimes I may lose people. Sometimes I get a little complicated or in the weeds, but did a lot of this feel pretty uh, understandable or was it approachable?
I'm just. Yeah, and that's fine. Uh, you can always come back to this channel later and view it again. Alan and Ryan, like, download the actual casts, the actual sessions, and put them on YouTube so that there is no time limit on when they can be viewed. And I'm looking into that. I have to do it. I'm trying to get this out. Uh, but again, this is just a weird, uh, a fun glimpse into the way I tackle problems. I'm always going to be trying to do these problems trailing the class. I'm never going to go ahead of class in uh, messing around with them. I don't want to give you guys the answers, so to speak. But I really like this kind of pet logic, logic tests, logic. I don't know. I hope it kind of shows. In any case, I am going to say off the done. Off the closed. I hope that was helpful. So, thank you.